We continue our exploration of Arizona's complex water system with a look at Arizona's groundwater. Understanding sustainable water for Arizona's future means understanding the balance between all aspects of water supply and our water demand. You'll recall that Arizona has three major sources of water supply. Our surface water primarily exists in the rivers and lakes. Our groundwater supply is underground in aquifers. And our affluent comes from our wastewater treatment plants for water that we can reuse. This map of the state has darker blue areas where we can see the major aquifers within the state. Most of our major aquifers are alluvial aquifers located in the southern portion of the state. Groundwater can be found in other areas, such as up in the northeastern part of the state, located in bedrock. Most of the major aquifers we are seeing here are old river deposits, gravel, located in depths ranging from shallow to very deep. Water is stored in the spaces between the underground gravel. Some of the aquifers farther up north are in bedrock, such as sandstone. The amount of space that's available to hold water is smaller and much of the water is stored in cracks in the bedrock, making it hard to find and limiting the amount of water that can be stored in the aquifer. Depending on what part of the state you're examining, we have ancient water in deeper aquifers, such as the Phoenix and Tucson basins. And we have more recent water in shallower aquifers, such as the Verde River and Santa Cruz River basins. We pump from most aquifers, so groundwater can be either or both. Now you see an idea that we have aquifers spread out, but the one thing to notice is that they are not everywhere. There are places where groundwater is harder to find. Sustainable safe yield is a common term used to describe the sustainable use of groundwater. This is essentially a state of groundwater management where the amount of water that flows out or is pumped out of an aquifer is equal to the amount of water that is recharged into the aquifer. An example would be filling a bathtub with water while draining it, and the depth of the water in the tub always stays the same. If we pump more groundwater than is being recharged, then we are mining groundwater at a rate faster than it is being replaced. When we mine groundwater, there can be undesirable consequences. Water levels can decline, requiring deeper and deeper wells until eventually the aquifer goes dry. Rivers that depend on water flowing into them from aquifers, such as the Verde River and the Santa Cruz River, can decline and even go dry. When we pump water from an aquifer, air begins to fill the spaces between the gravel, which will cause the gravel to compress and lower the surface level. This subsidence of land can damage water lines, roads, and buildings. There have been some parts of the states where subsidence has been occurring at rates of one to two inches per year, and in some cases have subsided 10 feet in 50 years. So groundwater may seem a little simpler than surface water, but it has its share of uncertainty that make the future of its management in Arizona a bit more difficult. Even though the concept of managing groundwater for safe yield is a well-accepted sustainability concept, the data to decide if this is occurring or how it could be achieved is not readily available for all aquifers. Thus, what levels of pumping may achieve safe yield for an aquifer 
are unknown, and the impacts the weather or climate changes may have on safe yield are also unknown for many aquifers. Additionally, if a well is pumping close to but not exactly at safe yield, and there is a large amount of water in storage underground compared to how much is being pumped, then not being at safe yield may be practical. But if there's a relatively small amount of water in storage underground, this could be a highly unsustainable situation. Unfortunately, we also do not know estimates of water storage within most aquifers. And then to make things more complex, there is now some uncertainty about groundwater rights in Arizona. The law on groundwater rights has long been founded on the concept that surface water rights and groundwater rights are not connected and are entirely two separated bodies of law. But if you will recall, the physical systems that replenish groundwater aquifers are not really separated from rivers and lakes. In fact, much of the water recharged into aquifers comes from rivers and lakes. And some rivers rely upon water from aquifers flowing back into the river system to maintain the flow. For the last several decades, Native American tribes have been negotiating the adjudication of their surface water rights. Their claim is that Native Americans have been using the surface waters of the West long before those claiming first use rights started using surface water. Thus, some of the existing surface water rights should belong to Native American communities. Rights to the Gila River watershed have been adjudicated for the Gila River Indian community, wherein some of the water rights to water in the Gila River formerly held by others has been transferred to GRIC. Recently, a court ruling on an issue related to this adjudication indicated that there is a legal connection between groundwater and surface water in the natural physical systems of rivers and streams. The court suggested that when rain falls on the land and soaks into the ground, this creates a groundwater right as depicted in the blue areas on this map. When rain falls on the ground and flows into rivers, this creates a surface water right as shown with the blue arrows on the map. However, the case of a river where water flows back and forth between the river and an adjacent aquifer, as shown in this green area, the groundwater is linked to surface water flows, and thus groundwater rights are in fact related to surface water rights and must be considered when adjudicating Native American surface water rights. This means anyone who's been using a groundwater right to pump water from a, a river related aquifer, such as the green areas on this map, may have part of their rights assigned to Native American communities. If, when, and how much still remains uncertain. The water sim model has a computational design that pulls data for cities and regions all across Arizona, including the 33 cities of the Metro Phoenix area. This includes water for riverine habitats, habitats located near riverbanks or riparian areas. It's a fairly complicated model. It's probably one of the most sophisticated urban mass balance models in the world. It computationally models the region's rivers and reservoirs, the regional groundwater supply, as well as the demand balance for any selected region. It was built through a significant amount of research and continues to serve researchers. In the default setting for water sim, climatic conditions have remained fairly constant since 2015. 
but population growth has continued and in 2050, water demands exceed supply. All of the outputs, such as agriculture, river habitats, human use, and economic use, take out more than inputs can provide. Water sim can also be set for drought conditions, reducing the output to all systems. If more water is used than is present in existing ground and surface water reserves, then the system is unsustainable 